here and welcome to our third episode of Voyages at Sea. Um, we are here at BUEI, but in different places. And I want to introduce you to some of the crew that you're going to see today. Uh, the first one that I'd like to introduce you to is Braxton. Can you say hello, Braxton? Hi, everybody. All right, Braxton's going to be helping us today with any of the questions or, or answers that we'll be um, looking at in the chat box over to the side here from Zoom. So if you're joining us by Zoom, you can help us with your fast fingers by answering some of those questions and um, bringing some of your questions onto the chat box. And then um, we will have Braxton um, share them with us. And um, as we go through the activities and um, the eco schools portion, you'll also have some question and answers there. If you're joining us by Facebook or by CITV today, not to worry, you can also participate. You just may be telling um, somebody in your family or somebody at home some of the answers to your questions, but we are here for another wonderful voyage. Now, this is a time when um, we haven't, humans haven't been traveling as much as we have before. On Wednesday, we saw that they, that on a normal time, um, there are lots and lots of boats that are on the ocean doing voyages, but there are actually other creatures that are able to travel right now. And so I want to get us started, but the way that I want to do that is these, these uh, species or these creatures that are traveling, um, there's a name for that movement, especially if they're moving from one place to another kind of on a regular pathway. Does anybody have the word for that? What that movement might be? I'm going to start sharing my screen. And while I'm doing that, um, you all can start using your fast fingers to type that into the chat. Let me see if I can just move over. Um, and let me see. Looks like we got some correct answers in the chat, Julie. Oh yeah, okay. Do you wanna share what the word is then? Yep, they said migration. Ah, okay, all right. So um, yeah, it is migration. And so I want to know, first of all, Braxton, can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. So I, I had a feeling it didn't go through the first time. Um, let me go back and share it again. Okay, there we go. Got, right. Got it? Okay, yes, it's migrations. That's right. So our episode today is all about migrations and migrations with lots of different animals. Um, and we're going to be really focusing on the ocean migrations or the ones in water. But if you can think of other creatures that migrate that you know about, um, you can list those as well. But my first question to you is name some animals that um, voyage at sea. So what are some creatures that make voyages at sea. What do you think? Put some into the chat box for Braxton, please. So whale. Whales, um, yeah. Sharks. Yeah. Um, salmon. Fish. Fish, yes. Yeah. yeah. Anybody want to be specific about maybe a special one that you can think humpback of? Humpback whale. Oh, a humpback whale, yeah. Dolphins. Yeah. Dolphins, yes, that's true. All right, we'll take a couple more and then I'm gonna show you my list. Okay. Um, somebody said tuna. Tuna, yes, that's an important one too. And uh, blue whale. And the blue whale, yeah, absolutely. All right, so here are some of the ones that I kind of gathered. And in some cases I'm being really specific and then in other cases I'm kind of being very general about it. So you can see lots of sharks, right? Basking sharks, blue sharks, bowhead whales, um, crabs, dolphins, the gray whale, great white shark. Here's some more, humpback whale, jellyfish, sea turtles, sperm whales, tiger sharks, tuna, and even the little zooplankton, and then eels and lobster also make voyages at sea. That's a lot of different types of animals that will be moving around in the ocean. And it takes a lot of energy if you're going to make that, that movement or that migration. So my next question is, why do animals migrate? This is a little animation of a, a gray whale going across um, the Pacific coast around from uh, all the way up to Alaska. 
and down to um, south to Mexico. So why would they make this migration? I mean, that's a lot of work to go 10,000 miles round trip. Can anybody tell me one of the reasons why they might want to migrate? Um, Do they want to change their view? Food and for breeding? Okay, food and for breeding, yeah, those are really important. If we think about how humans have certain things that they need in order to survive as a species, one of them is to be able to eat. Um, one of them is to make sure that you're comfortable enough, right? So um, even, even now, uh, humans actually do travel a fair amount and they do their own migration sometimes. Um, in times when it's cold, they might come to a place like Bermuda, where it's warmer in the winter, um, and they might be able to travel, I, even though like we're in a pandemic and we don't travel as much, um, people do um, that, but it, animals do as well. So they're going to follow um, these patterns in order to go places where they can find more food and they can also um, be able to be a little bit more comfortable so that they can conserve their energy. Okay, and also that conservation of energy allows them to be able to have more offspring and uh, healthier offspring as well. So um, the, um, the whales that migrate, the longest migration is by the gray whale. Okay, and that is one of the longest migrations in the world, but actually um, there is a bird that can migrate much longer distances than that. Um, for insects, the longest migration is the desert locust, okay, and that can travel actually about 3,000 miles, which is amazing, and there's a butterfly that migrates the longest distance as well. Uh, does anybody know the name of that type of butterfly? We actually have some resident po populations of those butterflies here. Does anybody know? Um, some ashes in chat are monarch, the monarch butterfly. Yeah, the monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterfly has an amazing um, range that it's able to go, but it's not the same generation. So the one that leaves from the north and goes south to Mexico um, is the same one, but as it's going back north, it's actually four generations before it gets back north. So it's a really strange cycle, but that whole pattern allows for the, um, the survival of the species. Okay, so we're gonna get back into um, how they know which way to go. So we were talking about navigation on Wednesday, and now I want to know if you can think of ways that we were trying to navigate. So we were, I'm thinking now, we talked about using a compass, we talked about um, using the stars to help us navigate. Um, you could actually use a sextant, so you could measure the angle on the horizon from the sun. And if you knew what time it was, you could actually figure out where you were. Um, so those are some of the tools that we were using to navigate. But what about animals? Are they doing the same thing? Well, you'd be amazed, but actually they kind of do. Okay, so one of our uh, voyages at sea um, ways of finding direction was by using a compass and also by using magnetic fields. So um, we're not as sensitive to magnetic fields in our body, but there are some animals that can really do this quite well. Um, also, there are some animals that are able to use sun, moon, and stars. So let's take a look here. This is not um, one that makes a voyage at sea, but I just wanted to start out by um, showing you the honeybee. And the honeybee is really important because it does all the pollinating that we need, but they also have to be able to go back to their hive. And so they're able to actually see light in a different way than our eyes can see. And uh, what they see is polarized light. I don't know if any of you have ever played with polarized glasses or had uh, polarized glasses, but if you turn them at a different angle, it actually changes the shading in there and their eyes kind of work that way. It's pretty amazing to me that scientists were able to figure this out, but they um, actually were able to figure out that they, they use that photo polarized light in order to be able to see and navigate. So they can actually communicate to each other where something is by um, the, the type of light that is seen when they're navigating. 
Um, birds also use the sun to help them orient, but they, if they don't have the sun kind of available to them because it's a really cloudy day, they actually have an internal compass to them that senses a bit of a magnetic field so that when the sun's not as reliable, they're able to um, still navigate um, on a cloudy day. Okay, so here we are in the ocean, the beautiful sky, and we're navigating by the stars. Well, guess who else can navigate by the stars? This guy, <laughs> it's a mallard duck. So um, navigation at night means you have to be able to use the stars to orient to your direction, maybe the moon, but really it's more reliable to, to have that map of the stars. And there have been some really crafty experiments that have been used in planetarium. So planetarium is projection of the, the night sky on like a dome. And um, scientists have figured out that some birds actually have a stellar map, like a mental map of where the stars are that help them orient when they're flying either north or south for the, um, for the winter or summer. So it's pretty amazing that they are able to figure this out, first of all, and that we know that um, birds can use that, um, the, the stars. So another creature that's actually in the ocean that uses sun and cues from the um, light of the sun or the moon, or actually nighttime and daytime, is the zooplankton. And the zooplankton um, that you see on the left, the little small flea-like creature, is um, the base of the food chain. And the rest of the animals that are in the ocean actually rely on this because as the smaller fish eat the, the zooplankton, then the bigger fish can eat those. And so we really do need to have a healthy population of those in there and they have to, to be able to take care of themselves. So during the day, if you look in this picture, in this image, you can see that um, they actually go, that little dotted layer is deeper in the ocean where it's darker um, during the daytime when the sun is actually shining some light into the water. And then at night, when it's a little bit safer for them to, to move about, they will go closer to the surface where they can feed. Okay. On Wednesday, we also talked about another way that we might navigate, and that's using landmarks. But if we're talking about ocean-going creatures, then they're not using these kinds of bu buildings or anything like that that humans have made to kind of mark the land. But animal ocean voyagers can actually use some markers beneath the sur surface of the water. A gray whale, for instance, as we saw on the animated slide, migrates 10,000 or more miles. And as it's going along that coast of California, um, it might actually recognize some of the same markers under the water. It's not gonna look like a building, but it's going to look like something to them. And so they're able to kind of have their own type of map. Dolphins do this as well. So that while they're migrating, they're because they're such um, intelligent creatures, they're able to really not only use this, but for themselves, but they can communicate um, as well. And so that might be part of their communication. Okay, if you're not a big creature like a dolphin or a whale, you still might get carried on ocean currents. So here's some examples of some things that might get carried along. I bet you recognize some of them. Jellies, the jellyfish. Um, there's lobster larvae, so the uh, one life stage after the eggs hatch, um, these larval stages actually might get carried along on an ocean current because they're really tiny. Fish eggs can get carried on the ocean currents, and then they might end up in a place um, like where we are in the North Atlantic Ocean in the Sargasso Sea, and the Sargasso might be a great place for them to actually start to grow up and live a part of their uh, life stages until they are big enough to actually move around a little bit uh, more outside of those currents, or they might still continue to get carried. Um, they've also found that jellyfish might use the magnetic field of the earth to help them navigate, which is pretty interesting to think about when you've got this invertebrate like that, that seems to just kind of cruise along wherever um, the, the water takes them, but they actually are able to kind of navigate. Now, um, other marine species are able to use that magnetic field and the currents. Here's another example. 
that you recognize this person, this one, not a person, right? <laughs> so that is Crush from Finding Nemo and Nemo and Dory. And so, or Marlin and Dory. And so these guys together, um, especially the turtles, um, actually use the currents. In this case, it was the East Australian current over by Australia. Um, but we have our own currents over on the Atlantic Ocean as well. And some of the other great species that migrate, especially around Bermuda, are these guys. I bet you all have seen some of those here before. The green turtle. So the green turtle lives here in Bermuda um, for just a certain period of their lives. They're actually not hatching their eggs here. Um, and they come here after they've hatched from a southern beach and uh, where the eggs were laid by a green turtle, mom green turtle, and then um, they come here as juveniles. So just like a young stage um, and they are coming here for their feeding ground. So they're coming to eat and you can see in the picture below that um, you can figure out what they're eating, right? They're eating seagrass or turtle grass and um, they're going to graze like little cows for a quite a long time, a few years. And, um, and then they're going to make their migration and go back to a place where they can breed. And then they can have lay their own eggs and then they'll start um, building their population. And you might see the juveniles here. So well, who we see here are the juvenile stages of um, the, the green turtles. Other turtles that are kind of seen around this area. Um, out in the ocean offshore actually are the loggerhead turtles. Those are the ones that get to be about a thousand pounds, pretty amazing size. And they would need a lot of food and a lot of energy in order to get to be that big. So they're going to migrate north where the food in the summertime is going to be richer and they're going to be able to find more. Um, and, but their breeding ground is gonna be where it's warmer. Here's another turtle that can be seen on coral reefs. This is called the hawk's bill. And you can actually look at this picture and see the, the little hawk bill on it. Um, and those, uh, these ocean going creatures are actually keeping a coral reef healthy um, with, uh, with their eating and their feeding. So this is one part of their, their um, places to be and it's their feeding ground, but their nesting grounds are going to be in a tropical area once again. So, um, and actually the temperature um, makes a difference into whether those, those eggs develop into male or female um, turtles. So it's, it's a really interesting kind of feedback loop, the whole thing about the water in the ocean and currents and all of the other things and how they interact with these species and their migrations. Okay, one last um, animal that I haven't talked about. I know I haven't talked about a lot of them, but the one that I wanted to just kind of share with you is going to start um, with um, start us off for our activity. And this is the humpback whale. So the humpback whale, the reason why I want to talk about it is because this is the time of year where we can see them, which is really cool um, because they are actually coming close to Bermuda at this time of year. And if you look at this picture, you can see that the blue dots kind of at the northern um, areas and the southern, most southern areas uh, mark the summer feeding grounds of humpback whales. And you can see that they're actually all over the world. They're not just around Bermuda. Um, they, they migrate in different places all over the world. And then there are some places where they think that those populations kind of stick around in the same area, but the other ones move to the poles in order to feed. And then they move to the equator or closer where it's warmer um, when they're breeding. And so when they're having their calves or they've gone up to feed and they're kind of putting on weight so that they can have a healthy calf, then they will, um, after that, they'll go and they'll have their calf over in uh, their breeding grounds or that's, and as they're moving back to the feeding grounds, um, they're passing by Bermuda. So what are we looking for if we're going to look to see a whale? Well, actually around South Shore, um, here are some of the things that you might be able to spot. So here's one example. On the top right, you'll just see this mist. And what uh, when I was out whale watching, I actually heard 
the mist coming up because they're, the whales are mammals, they have to breathe air. So when they come to the surface to breathe air, they're spewing out just a little bit of water as well. And you might see a spout or you might actually see um, them breach, jump right out of the water, or you might actually catch a glimpse of their fluke or their tail. You might see a fin slap or a tail slap, and those would be exciting things to see, but this is the time of year when you could actually spot them. They're just getting ready to go further north, so um, kind of mid-April is about when they start to move along, but they, they'll have their calves with them. They'll be in pods so that they can communicate to one another as they're migrating and moving. So um, it's a pretty amazing time. And it's so great that we're here in Bermuda where we can see that. And you could actually see it from the shore um, up in places around the South Shore. I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any questions. And while I'm doing that, I just want to kind of show you, um, it's hard to see actually, there's a seamount right behind me, right over here. And that seamount actually has Bermuda right on top, okay? And um, so if you were a whale, <laughs> you would actually be passing by and these might be some of the underwater landmarks that a whale might see. They might see Argus Bank and Challenger and then they might come right past our seamount and if they come in close, because South Shore is kind of close to the edge of the seamount, we might be able to spot them there. So were there any questions that you saw? Braxton? Yeah, there were a couple, but we can uh, get to them later. Oh, okay, that sounds great. All right, so what I'm gonna do is hand over the, um, the whale presentation to Hannah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got it. All right. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Miss Hannah. Thank you, Miss for that awesome introduction into the whale. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the humpback whale and do a fun craft to celebrate this. So the first thing I'd like for us to do is identify um, parts of this whale. So I'm going to point and I'm going to watch the chat. And so we're going to start right here at his head and we come on over. What's this? See your fingers flying in the chat, the holes right here. The blow holes, exactly. So baleen whales have two blow holes, just like your nose. And then I come down here to his, his eye. And then the ear is actually a little hole that's just right there on the whale. And then we follow down his back. And this right here is called the, anybody know? Fin, okay, what kind of fin? Starts with a D. Dorsal fin, exactly. And it's this hump right here that you see on the whale. That's why it's called the humpback. So there's a little ridge right there that on other whales is usually not quite as pronounced. So that's why it's called the humpback. And then we go on down to the, the tail, but what's the real word for tail? Starts with an F. Am I watching? Fluke, exactly. So the pretty fluke that you can see here. And then we'll slide along to our, what are these? Flippers, exactly. And they have these scalloped ridged edges on them. And then this right here, these lines that you see, can you see the lines on the whale? Does anybody know what these are called? These are called throat grooves. So they have about 14 to 25 of them and they're folds in the skin. And what happens is when the whale opens his big mouth and scoops in a lot of water, these throat grooves expand, allowing them to hold in a huge amount. So they can really scoop up a giant school of krill or fish. And then they push the water out through something called, do you know what's in their mouth? What did the humpback have in their mouth? They lean, so it's not teeth, it's actually something like, it works like a filter, and it's baleen. So it's this hard, rough material that we're gonna talk about, but that's just what they push it out. And so again, in their mouth is trapped the krill and some types of small fish um, that they then eat. So my next question to you is, what is special about the whale fluke? About the humpback whale fluke, does anybody know? So take a look at your finger. You see your fingerprint? Your fingerprint is your own fingerprint. Nobody has the same fingerprint as you. It's unique, right? You can see Braxton showing me his exactly. So the humpback whale 
it's like their fingerprint. So every single humpback has a different whale print. And this is really cool because it allows us to take pictures and track them without getting too close to the whale. So people like Andrew Stevenson and other passionate whale people are out there creating a big database of where these guys are traveling. So we know on the map from this Julie that they're migrating by. So people in all these different countries can take pictures and send in their photos of the whale tails and then we can track them. So it's a pretty cool way for us to interact with them without having to get too close. Um, but their most noticeable feature, so I'm gonna show you the humpback and I'm gonna show you another baleen whale. This is a right whale. What's really noticeably different? This is a blue whale. What do you notice that's super different? I'll give you a hint, they're right here. So these are flippers. Look how huge they are. If you compare those to the other ones, they're more, much, much bigger. So these flippers can grow up to 16 feet long and they are really important for their for the whales to be able to say, um, dance because we know that they're very vocal, right? The humpback whale is the most vocal of all the whales and they sing beautiful songs and their flippers allow them to dance and twirl and jump up out of the water. And um, yeah, and they also help, help them when they trap schools of fish. So they're actually, their Latin name is Big Wing of New England. So the hump is right here, the humpback, but their Latin is talking about their massive long flippers, which are huge if you compare them to any of the other baleen whales. Right, so how big do you think these guys can get? If their flippers are 16 feet long, how long do you think the whale can get? Any ideas? 30 feet, okay, yeah, even bigger. 50 feet, exactly. So between 40 and 50 feet, they will grow. Um, and they can grow up to between 50 and 80 years is how long that they can live. But now we're gonna talk about the whale and the specifically whaling. So whaling industry, um, not whaling industry, but people have been killing whales and using the whales um, for 5,000 years now. Um, but whaling really started in the 1800s and that's when we started heavily whaling and using them. Um, the whales have actually been really vital to the survival and the growth of mankind um, because we use all kinds of parts of this whale. But does anybody know why we might use or what part of the whale or why on earth we would go out there and hunt a whale? For what purpose? I have a harpoon here to show you. This is a harpoon that Miss Julie's husband found, which is pretty cool. Um, and, but do, oh, so I see the answers are coming in. Oil, exactly. So there's three really important things that we used from the whale. The first thing was the oil. So they would take the blubber and the fat and they would melt it down. And that oil was used for powering lights. So they would have sometimes street lamps powered with them, oiling machines, and um, also, yeah, used in the textile factories. Um, so making clothing, making rope, also for making perfumes and soaps. Um, so they basically used whale oil for pretty much everything that we use fossil fuels for today. Um, baleen, so what I just showed you here, it's really hard and flexible. So this was actually called the plastic of the 1800s. And you can see here, they would make toothbrushes from it, toys, um, horse whips, corset, which is the outfit that the ladies wore around their waist um, to make their bodies look really skinny, something really painful to wear. Um, and so the, the oil, the baleen, and then also something really gnarly called ambergris. Does anybody know what ambergris is? Ooh, it's really gross. It is basically a giant smelly rock that washes up on the beach and it's whale puke, whale vomit. And they, this is really, really important for the perfume and cosmetic industry. One pound of this costs 60, thousand dollars. So there's people all on the south coast of England who are adamantly looking for smelly rocks on the coast. If this was real, I'd quit my job today and just go and travel the world, I think. That would be my plan. Um, but yeah, so we're going to leave you on a little positive note. Um, so they have many of these, the whales have many awesome properties and they've helped human beings grow and to become the strong nations that we are today. We found some other source of energy. So, but unfortunately we started over whaling them from, from the 1800s till about the mid 1900s, we were heavily whaling. And thankfully in the 1980s, there was a global ban 
And to leave you on a positive note, the humpback whale has come right back in the numbers. There's over 35,000 of them in the Atlantic. And now we're gonna do a really cool craft to celebrate the whale. So I hope you all have your materials ready and I'm gonna share the video with you now. All right, you guys, so in this activity today, we are going to make a rocking whale. Um, and so the materials that you will need will be a paper plate, um, some googly eyes, not necessary, you can always draw on the eyes, but we do like googly eyes for the crafts. Um, either a stapler, a hot glue gun, or a glue stick. Um, I prefer to use a hot glue gun, but either of these just to help secure your little whale. Um, a pair of scissors, a Sharpie, well, a black pen, and a Crayola or some paint. Remember, if you're going to be painting, to put on a paint shirt and to protect your table with newspaper. Um, so I'm going to paint it. And so we're going to flip it over and we're going to paint the paper plate blue because my whale is going to be blue, but you can decide on whatever color you want them to be. You can put some whale songs in the background as well at home. I can listen to what the humpback song sounds like. So now once you've completed that, this craft is actually quite simple to do. So I'm sure um, all ages can do this. The result is quite cool. So if you're, when you go out there looking for whales, um, we find it's easy if you stick, when you turn the engine off, that you listen for the pshh, and it's this, the sound of whales coming up to the surface and breathing. And that's often the first thing that you'll see or hear. Um, in our case, we heard it um, and then you're able to locate the whale and it flips on over. All right, so you're gonna paint your paper plate um, and um, you kind of want to let it dry a little bit. So maybe set it aside and dry it, but I've already done one for you so that I can show you the next step. But then what you're gonna do is you're gonna fold them in half. Fold it in half like this. Move your paint to the side. And then you're gonna take this bit here and you're gonna fold it over like that. Okay. And you're gonna open your whale. You're gonna fold that bit down. And you're gonna close it again. So now this is the front of my whale. You kind of see? So then you're going to cock glue this together or staple it. I'm gonna staple it, maybe. Okay, I've stapled that together. So now I want to create the tail. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your marker and you're going to, this is going to be the top of your whale here. So he's going to go like that and like this to here. Okay, so you're going to go down the back of the whale and then up the tail. And then you're going to go right there. Okay, so that's the first line you're going to make. Then you're going to take your scissors and you're going to cut down like that. My blue nails match the whale. Okay, so then you have that. So now, if you fold it out, this is your weird tail. That's not quite the right shape, is it? So then you're going to go in and you're going to cut the tail so that it looks more like a tail. So I am going to cut it like this. And I'm going to cut back down like that. Okay. So that when I open it, I have the tail. And so you can color in your tail. You can give them any or with the paint, give them a little pattern. But there you have it. So that's the first step. Then um, what you're also going to need is a pipe cleaner. Or you can use paper and you can um, roll it up and have like a little spout, whatever you like. It doesn't also doesn't need to be glittery. It can be any color. 
Um, but what you're going to do, um, I'll fold it this way to get three little spouts like that. Then I'm going to twist the bottom together and I want to insert him up here. So I'm going to take this. Cut a little hole. And then stick the pipe cleaners through the hole. You might need to glue it, but for the sake of that's just resting, I'm going to make it look like water. And it just looks like he's got sparkly hair. <laughs> All right. And then, final step. Googly eyes, my favorite. Ooh. I'm going to use glue stick for this. And it's best to use hot glue. If your mom lets you use it, you should use hot glue. Just don't touch the metal bit. All right, there you have it. It's your paper plate whale and it rocks. <laughs> Be sure to share it on our page. We'd love to see how they turn out. Um, All right, so that was my paper whale, and we're really excited to see yours. So Miss Shania is going to show you now. Oh, well, do we have any questions first? Anybody asking me anything that you'd like to talk about quickly before we roll on? No? Okay, I see someone saying, can you replay the cutting part? If you can replay it on Facebook, um, it'll be, it's streamed on there. Um, and also the worksheet that I've got the instructions fit on it. Um, the whale fluke. I should have been saying fluke. Um, but yeah, great. So we're going to roll on. Shania can show you some other crafts that you can do. Um, and I hope you were able to follow along a bit and show us what you made. Now that you've completed your activity with Miss Hannah, you can show us your creations on palette.com. To access palette.com, you can go back onto the BUEI webpage where you downloaded the activity sheet and the materials list, you will see the QR code to access palette.com. You can also create these whales out of air cartons that you can show us on our palette.com site. You can actually use the whole carton to make a family of whales. Along with the ad carton whales, you can also make construction whale parts. This is a fin that we've made. You can put it on your arm and flap out like a humpback whale. You can also make a whale fluke. We can't wait to see what you've created. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Shania, for showing us some extra activities. And we cannot wait to see what you guys put together. Also, a little reminder that Braxton is always looking at the chat if you guys have any questions. And we'll stop for, at the end for those. Um, but on to the next section. My name is Miss Hannah, and I am the Eco Schools Coordinator here at BUEI. So Eco Schools is a global program that helps to inspire and reward local eco clubs on the island. So BUEI is our national operator and we help you guys giving you all the resources and even a, um, an easy schedule to follow to make sure you guys can have success in making sustainable changes in your school. So by a virtual show of thumbs up or a me in the group chat, I'd love to see how many of you guys are part of a school that is an eco school or part of an eco club at your school. Oh, I see a couple of me's in the chat. Nice, I like to see how you guys are part of this eco community. So what is the connection to eco schools and our lesson on migration? So it's actually more than just animals that migrate our oceans today. There is more than 14 billion pounds of trash that's actually dumped in the ocean every year. And this trash follows the ocean currents just like our jellyfish and our turtles and is pushed all around the the oceans. Especially in the Atlantic Ocean, this trash actually accumulates in the center to create what we now call the North Atlantic Garbage Patch. Now this garbage patch was first found in 1972 and it is estimated to be hundreds of kilometers in size and it actually has a density of more than 200,000 pieces of debris per every square kilometer. That's a lot of trash in our ocean. So let me ask you guys, I want you to get your fingers in the chat. Where do you think all of this trash is coming from? Coming from us, yeah, exactly. 
coming from us, coming from people, coming from the beach. Exactly. So this trash is not created by our whales, our turtles, our dolphins, the animals that are trying to migrate. It's created by people. So it comes off our boats, it comes off of our beaches, it comes off of our land. Exactly. So another question for you, how is this trash affecting or impacting the animals that live in our oceans? Impacting it badly. Exactly, exactly. So what are some of the impacts we see? Yep, so a lot of our marine animals are actually consuming this plastic because a lot of the plastic bags look like jellyfish and a lot of the little blue pieces of plastic look like fish. So a lot of our marine animals are actually consuming this plastic and then not surviving post that. Yep, or a lot of animals are getting entangled. So a lot of the, the human trash that ends up in the ocean, some of it is actually fishing nets and a lot of animals get stuck in this fishing net. So it's very detrimental to our marine animals that this trash is in the wild. So what can we do to help? So one of the pathways that Eco Schools Bermuda offers to our local schools is called waste and litter. So this pathway examines kind of the waste and litter in our environment, um, how we can minimize the amount of waste that we produce, and how can we make sure that we're disposing of our waste in a safe and environmentally friendly way. So first of all, we need to make sure our trash gets disposed of properly. So Bermuda has a pretty good waste management system, but I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions to make sure you know it just as well as we do. So I want you guys to get back in that chat. Who knows when their trash pickup day is? Mine is Friday. Do you guys know when your trash gets picked up at your house? Okay, I see Wednesday, I see Tuesday. Someone said today. All right, so a couple of you guys know it's really important to make sure that your trash gets out on the right day so it's not sitting on your road for a long time. Now, who has their blue recycling bags at their house? So not only your white and your black trash bags, but who also has their blue recycling bags? I see lots of me's. We do, we do. Nice. So it's important to make sure we separate normal trash from recycling trash to make sure that recycling trash gets recycled. Okay, last question here. Who can tell me what kind of things we actually recycle here in Bermuda? There are three things that we recycle. Glass, yep, glass, tin cans. We actually do not recycle plastic here in Bermuda. The third one is aluminum, exactly. So glass, tin, and aluminum are the three things that we recycle here in Bermuda. Nice work, guys. So even though we have a really good waste management system here in Bermuda, where we have our trash pickup days and we have a, at least a small system of recycling, I still seem to find trash in our natural environment. I've seen trash on the roads. I've seen trash on the railway trails. I even see trash on our beaches. So here are some easy tips that you can follow to make sure that your trash doesn't get blown into the environment. So the first thing is to make sure you have strong trash bins. So when you're putting your trash out to be picked up, it's not being blown away into the environment and it's not being ripped apart by birds or cats. The next thing you can do is to try and help clean up the trash that's already been blown into the environment. So either by doing a trash cleanup with KBB or even doing one with your friends. Who can show me a virtual thumbs up if you've ever been part of a trash cleanup before? I see a couple me's in the chat. I see Hannah's got her thumbs up. Nice guys, love to see that we're already doing something. We can always do more. So another huge thing we can do to reduce the trash that ends up in our environment is to reduce the amount of trash we produce in the first place. So the best way to do this is using the six R's. So do you guys know all of the six R's? I want to see it in the chat. Yeah, so the first three that a lot of us know is to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So when we talk about reducing, we're talking about decreasing your need for a wasteful, wasteful product, choosing sustainable alternatives instead. And then lots of us are saying reuse, yeah? So you can buy products that can be used over and over again rather than throwing something away every time. For example, having a metal water bottle instead of buying a plastic water bottle every day. And recycle is one that we've actually spoken about today already. So choosing items which can, uh, which the waste created can be recycled. So choosing to buy a glass jar of tomato sauce rather than a plastic bottle. Okay, so those are three, reduce, reuse, and recycle. What are the other threes that we now talk about? 
We do three, yeah. There's the three more R's. I'll give you a hint. One of them is repair. So fixing the things that we usually use over and over again, and instead of throwing it out as soon as it's broken, trying to fix it and giving it another use, trying to make it last a little longer before we make it into trash. All right, I see another one. I see refuse. So this is another one that we like to use, especially in the supermarkets. So when it comes to if you're going to Harrington Hundreds or if you're going to Miles and they have plastic bags, you have to refuse those plastic bags because they don't last very long. They're very detrimental to the environment. Um, and you can't recycle them here. So to refuse your plastic bags and make sure you bring your own or even have your laundry basket in the back of your car, you can put your groceries in that and bring it to your kitchen. We've got one more R. Someone said recognize, which is close, just close. Our last R is actually rethink. So when we talk about rethink, we want to change our perception of waste. So maybe something that you have that's in your waste bags that could actually be useful, something you can reuse again, or maybe it's your food scraps. You can put them into your compost bin and create soil for your garden, or you can try and regrow your food scraps and make more and put it into your home garden. All right, so um, I'm gonna just throw it over to Braxton really quick to see if we have any questions before I play a cool video from another country in the Caribbean that's working on their trash. Um, yeah, Hannah, uh, what can we do about the trash created by the COVID-19 pandemic? Very good question. So the trash that we're talking about today is the trash that we have all the time in our houses, but this COVID-19 COVID pandemic has caused a lot of new trash that we don't know what to do with yet, and a lot of it cannot be recycled. But one easy thing that we can do is to reduce our use of this disposable single-use masks and to try and use cotton masks or cloth masks. So I have a cloth mask that I use and I put it straight in the washing machine and I can use it again every time. And you can even get cool styles that match your outfits each day too. All right, any other questions? That's all the time we got for right now, Hannah. Awesome, all right. So I'm gonna jump into my video to end my segment and then we'll do something else. So. Uh, my video is called Bahamas Can Be Plastic Free. So um, I'm going to play this short video. It's from some students in Deep Creek Middle School in Eleuthera, Bahamas. And they remind us not to litter. And, all we can, and if we can reduce our waste and clean up after ourselves, maybe we can be waste free too. So let's hear from those students now. So it's not just us in Bermuda who have a waste problem, it's us all around the world and we can all do our part to help a little bit. All right, so we've got a couple extra minutes before we close our session today. I'm gonna to throw it back over to Braxton to see if we have any questions about the whole session. Yeah, so a question came up earlier. Maybe Julie, you can answer this. Um, somebody asked, what are zooplankton and what do they eat? So zooplankton are like the tiniest little creatures and they actually eat phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are like tiny little plants. So um, it's all part of this food chain where there are just little smaller things that they're able to eat, but they get their, the producers of the ocean are these tiny little phytoplankton or little plants in the ocean and the zooplankton eat those. Um, sometimes they could eat like tiny little other creatures too, but they're mainly eating the phytoplankton. And then those zooplankton like copepods and things like that are in krill are starting to build up that whole um, food web that we have for some of the biggest creatures on the earth, including the gray whale. Um, horse, Hannah Horso, maybe can you answer why amber grease is so expensive? Ooh, why it's so expensive. It's so expensive 
because um, it's used, it's, well, first of all, it's very, very rare. It's not all every day that you find whale vomit on the beach, but it's used in the manufacturing of perfume and cosmetics. And so um, there's a guy who just found one on the south coast of England and he got £100,000 pounds um, from one of the big cosmetics companies in France because they make all kinds of nice smelling things from something really smelly. The last question I got right here is that, do orcas pass by Bermuda? No, orcas don't because orcas prefer the colder waters. I see a lot of questions, are orcas whales or dolphins? Orcas are actually the largest dolphin. Um, they have that really big dorsal fin on them, like the dolphins, So, um, and they have teeth, so they fall into um, yeah, the dolphin side of the cetaceans. or. Yeah, mammals. Great. Um, I think that's all the questions um, I have right now. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. We've had just as much fun as you've had. And I'm going to throw it over to Carla to close our session for today. See you guys later. Bye, everybody. Oh, Carla, we don't have sound there. Adventure. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye for now.